The liquidity ratios are shown over here. We have already talked about them in the reading on the balance sheet, but very briefly, liquidity ratios give us a understanding of how easily a company can meet short-term obligations. The ratio that we didn't see before is the defensive interval ratio. This looks at the current assets divided by the daily cash expenditures. So if the current assets are 100 and the daily cash expenditure equals 10, then our defensive interval ratio is 100 over 10, which is 10. This essentially means that we have 10 days worth of short-term assets. So we can meet 10 days worth of daily expenditures. Now, some interpretation and judgment can come in. If you believe that receivables are not very liquid, then it might make sense to remove your receivables number when, when coming up with the defensive interval ratio. We can also evaluate the liquidity of a company by looking at the cash conversion cycle, which is also called the net operating cycle. This essentially measures the time between when a company spends money on inventory till the time that the company receives money on the sales that it makes. Obviously, if this period is short, that means high liquidity. If this period is long, that means low liquidity. The formula for calculating the net operating cycle is days of inventory on hand plus days of sales outstanding minus number of days of payables. To understand this formula, let's look at a simple example. Let's say that a company orders inventory over here. So this is where the inventory is received. Then the payment for that inventory happens 10 days later. So on day 10 is when we make the payment. So this is where money goes out. Let us say that the days of inventory on hand is 30, which means that it takes us 30 days to convert this inventory into product which is sold. That means that on day 30 over here is where the sale happens. And then on average, let's say that it takes 15 days to collect money. This sale, for example, is a credit sale and on day 45 is when we receive money. The net operating cycle or the cash conversion cycle is the time period from here to here. What is that? If you look at the days of inventory on hand, that is this point to this point. So that is 30. The days of sales outstanding, that is equal to 15 from here to here, minus the number of days of payables, which is 10. So the cash to cash cycle or the cash conversion cycle, as you can see from this picture is 45 minus 10, which is 35. You get the same answer using the formula. So 30 and 15 is 45 minus 10 is 35. And again, a relatively high number would mean low liquidity and a short number means high liquidity because the company is getting cash back very fast. Solvency ratios we have discussed when we talked about the balance sheet. Just as a refresher, the ratios are given again and these ratios measure a company's ability to pay back long-term debt. If you look at the debt to asset ratio, then Small amount of debt relative to a large asset base means that the company is financially strong, the leverage is low, so we are not too concerned about whether or not the company will be able to pay off debts if this number is small. So notice that with debt to asset ratio, low is good, debt to capital, so capital generally refers to the total money that has been raised, that's debt as well as equity. This should be low. Debt to equity ratios, again, low is safer. Financial leverage ratios, 
This is important. Here we divide total assets divided by equity. Now, a high ratio here means high leverage. So, in general, with these ratios, a high ratio means that there is a high level of debt or high level of leverage. And as we've discussed before, you need to look at these numbers in the context of the industry because in some industries, the level of debt or leverage will be high. In other industries, the level of debt or leverage will be low. Some more solvency ratios. An extremely important one is the interest coverage ratio, which is your operating income or earnings before interest and taxes divided by interest payments. This is called a coverage ratio because if this ratio, for example, is 10, what that means is that your operating income covers the interest amount 10 times. Here, the higher, the better. A high coverage ratio means that you are making a lot of operating income relative to the financial cost, which is interest in this case. Fixed charge coverage, this is EBIT plus lease payments divided by interest payments plus lease payments. You will understand this better when we do the chapter on long-term liabilities and leases later, but just to give you a very brief explanation. In the numerator, we use EBIT plus lease payments because typically EBIT is calculated after making lease payments. By adding back lease payments, we are looking at how much money we are making before the lease payments. Just like over here, we are looking at how much money we are making before making interest payments. So here we have the amount of money we make before lease payments divided by the total payments. Just like interest payments are an uh, obligation, similarly, lease payments are also an uh, obligation. So it makes sense to look at the sum of the two numbers. The profitability ratios that you are looking at here should seem very familiar. You saw these ratios when we did the income statement. Essentially, higher the better. Gross profit margin is the gross profit divided by revenue. Operating profit margin is operating income over revenue. Pre-tax margin is earnings before tax over revenue. And net profit margin is net income over revenue. Profitability ratios, where we look at the return on investment, these are mixed ratios. You will often see this particular ratio, return on assets. Return on assets is net income, which you get from the income statement, divided by average total assets. And the theme that I talked about earlier in terms of the income statement number in the numerator and the average balance sheet number in the denominator continues over here. Return on total capital is EBIT divided by average short and long-term debt. Now, in different textbooks, you might see a slightly different definition of capital. Here you see long-term debt and equity. In other textbooks, the total assets might be used. Return on equity is net income divided by average total equity. Return on common equity looks at the money that is available to common shareholders. If you recall your EPS calculation, you saw this expression there also. The net income minus preferred dividends is the amount available to common shareholders divided by average common equity gives you the return on common equity. Coming now to the DuPont analysis, which is important from a testability perspective, this brings together several ratios that we are talking about. Return on equity is net income divided by equity. This is an important ratio because it tells us how much net income we are generating relative to the equity or the amount that we have invested. Let's say that this particular ratio is 20%. That looks like a good number. Let's say that this is higher than the industry average, which say is 15%. The question then becomes the following. Where is this 20% coming from? And DuPont helps us with that analysis. 
We can think of net income over equity or return on equity as the product of return on assets and financial leverage. Return on assets is net income divided by total assets and financial leverage as we have seen on our earlier slide is assets divided by equity. Notice that when you multiply these two expressions the assets cancel out and you have net income divided by equity. So it is possible that we have a high net income over equity because of high leverage. High leverage means that our own equity investment is small, debt is high, which is why even though net income over assets is a small number, so let's say that this number is only 10%, but if assets over equity or financial leverage is 2, that will give us a net income over equity of 20. By decomposing net income over equity into these two ratios, we actually see that our 20% number is coming because of high leverage or high risk. Taking this one level further, we can say that return on assets can be written as net profit margin divided by total asset turnover. So the net profit margin is net income divided by sales and total asset turnover is given by sales divided by average total assets and then the financial leverage term comes down. This has not been decomposed so this is still assets over equity. Now if you multiply these three ratios you notice that again you are left with net income over equity because sales and sales cancel, assets and assets cancel. So again this tells us that the return on equity is partly explained by leverage but this decomposition return on assets as the product of net profit margin and total asset turnover tells us that the return on assets has these two components. We have a net profit margin which tells us about our profitability relative to sales and the asset turnover which tells us how efficiently we are using our assets. And with a 10% number it might be because we are using our assets very efficiently. So it is possible that net income over sales is only 5% but sales divided by assets is 2, which means that our real value is coming because of our efficient use of assets and not because we are very profitable in terms of net income over sales. Now to summarize what we've discussed so far, I think from an exam perspective, understanding the two kinds of DuPont ratios is extremely important. So I will erase what you see over here and just summarize the two types of DuPont ratios that you must be on top of. So return on equity is net income over equity. This can be written as return on assets which is net income over assets multiplied by financial leverage which is assets over equity and then decomposed into three components, we can say return on equity is net income over equity, which is equal to net income over sales times sales over assets, that's the total asset turnover, times the financial leverage, which is assets over equity. While I don't think you are likely to be tested on this, but you might as well also learn the five form decomposition of the return on equity. So here we essentially say that return on equity is equal to tax burden into interest burden into EBIT margin and all these numbers essentially are coming from the income statement. So we can look at net profit margin as coming from three sources. One is EBIT margin which is saying how efficient our operation is. The next is interest burden which tells us about our finance costs. So if the finance cost is low then this ratio will be high and tax burden which tells us about the tax. If the tax is low then this ratio will be high. 
and I will create a very simple balance sheet to illustrate this concept. Notice that our net profit margin can be written as the product of these three ratios. So net income over sales is equal to net income over EBT, earnings before tax. A high number for net income over EBT means that the tax is low. Multiplied by EBT over EBIT, so this divided by EBIT, a high number for this ratio means that interest is low. And then EBIT over sales, this is our operating profit margin. A high number means that our operating expenses are low. So the five form DuPont equation then becomes net income over EBT times EBT over operating profit times operating profit over sales times the total asset turnover, which is sales divided by assets multiplied by the financial leverage, which is assets over equity. Again, I will emphasize that you must know these two forms, net income over assets times assets over equity, and this form that essentially has three ratios, net profit margin, asset turnover, and financial leverage. Let us look at a problem which is a little bit difficult but illustrates the concepts we have spoken about. Over a three-year period, we are looking at the ROE of a company which is going up from 19% to 20% to 22%. The return on total assets is coming down. This tells us that the profitability of the company is coming down. Total asset turnover is going up slightly. So initially it is 2 and then in 2012 it is 2.1. We need to make an assessment about the net profit margin and financial leverage. And we'll do this by decomposing the ROE. If we look at the most basic form of the DuPont equation, that tells us that return on equity is equal to return on assets multiplied by financial leverage. Looking at the top row, we know that ROE is going up. Looking at the second row, we know that the return on total assets is coming down. Therefore, the leverage must be going up. So the financial leverage has increased. This means that we can rule out A and the answer must be B or C. If you take net income over assets or the return on assets, this ratio can be decomposed into the net profit margin, net income over sales, multiplied by the asset turnover ratio, sales over assets. We know that return on assets is coming down from the second row. Net income over sales, that is the profit margin that we need to evaluate. Sales over assets or asset turnover, this has been going up a little. The only explanation now is that net income over sales or profit margins must be going down. So the correct answer is C, net profit margin has decreased, but financial leverage has increased.